This presentation is about what a motor does when there's one specific voltage applied. Most motors are designed for use at a particular voltage and the engineer must decide on the gears to use with that motor for a particular task so that it delivers the most power possible. This presentation teaches you how to decide on the right gear ratio to use to get the most power out of your motor for a given voltage. So batteries, fuel cells, uh, and the VEX controller, for that matter, they each deliver a specific voltage. Uh, alkaline, triple A's, double A's, C's, D's, uh, they all deliver about 1.5 volts. Rechargeable versions of those same batteries usually deliver around 1.2 volts. Car batteries, they deliver 12 volts, and so on. If you try to draw a lot of current from a power source, its voltage starts to drop, making it complicated to decide on a gear ratio. But if the power source that you deliver has the exact same voltage or roughly the same voltage for all the currents that that motor will use, well then one simple measurement will let you get the most power from your motor. And that measurement is the stall torque. So that's what we want to talk about. All right, speed depends on the load torque. So when you just have a little motor and you hook up a power source to it and you start to spin it, there's no load on that and that's going to spin at its highest RPM or its highest angular velocity which we use the omega symbol for. All right, And so that's omega naught. We're going to refer to that as omega naught, the speed that it spins at when there's no load. This is its angular velocity. All right, Angular velocity um, is used, we use the letter omega is the symbol that we use and an angular velocity is measured in units of angle per time. So we could have revolutions per minute, we could have revolutions per second, we could have degrees per second or radians per second. As a matter of fact, radians per second is the SI unit for angular speed. The lowercase Greek letter tau is a symbol that we use for torque and we've talked about that in a previous video. Torque is measured in units of distance times a force like pound inches or newton meters. So, and of course newton meters is the SI unit for torque, uh, but because the distance and force are in perpendicular directions, it cannot be simplified to the same units of energy that we saw when we looked at work. Newton meters is also equal to joules, but that's when the force and the direction of motion or the direction of that force are in the same direction. That's when that's when energy in the form of work is at its maximum. Here, for torque, they are perpendicular to each other, so it's not quite the same thing. But we are going to see later how torque does relate to energy. Now, we've got a nice little graph here. What's going on? Well, we want to see the relationship between speed and torque, because we're, we're interested in both of these. These are both important when we're setting up a, when an engineer or designer is setting up a motor driven system uh, and uh, using gears or direct drive or uh, we want to know what these values are. You know, it helps us to pick what motor we're going to use or what gear ratio we're going to use. So if we look at our chart here we can see that speed is on the vertical axis and omega naught is the fastest we're going to go. All right, That's the highest angular velocity we're going to be able to achieve because there's no load but we'll have zero torque. As torque increases, we see a linear relationship here that the speed is going to drop in a linear fashion the greater the torque gets. And up until the point where we have so much torque that we end up with zero speed. And that is our stall torque, or tau stall. So what, is it, you know, what does it mean that this is a linear relationship with torque? All right, the fact that speed has a linear dependence on torque means that the graph of speed versus torque is always going to be uh, a straight line. And we can see that here. Um, can you apply what you learned in algebra to figure out the speed if you know the torque? Well, the main point of this PowerPoint is to show that the maximum power is at half the stall torque. All right, and that's something we're going to be developing as we go along. You don't have to be able to prove it to use it, but it's, uh, it's great to be able to do that, and that's what we're going to do. Now, where did this little equation come from? Well, we know from your algebra classes that the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. Well, in this case, y 
is speed in omega. So y omega is equal to mx plus b. Well, m is the slope of our line. And well, in this case, the slope of our line is the rise over the run. And we can see that the rise of this line here is going downward. And how much is it going downward? It's going downward by omega naught. So we have a, a negative omega naught as our rise. And the run, the distance along here, is equal to t stall. So negative omega naught over t stall or tau stall, that is our slope. All right, so y equals mx. Well, the x-axis is torque. So we put a tau here. And of course, then we have to add b to that. Well, b is the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is omega naught. So we have to add the whole thing to omega naught. So using the equation for a line, y equals mx plus b, in this case, we get omega equals negative omega naught over tau stall times tau plus omega naught. Or our angular velocity is going to be equal to the negative no load speed divided by the stall torque times the amount of torque that we have at any given point, and then we add that to our no load speed. Now this slide shows that where this line is placed and uh, where the y and x intercepts are, or where the no load speed and the stall torque are, is dependent on the voltage. The greater the voltage you provide to that motor, the, uh, the bigger the area is under that curve. All right. So this slide shows how speed and torque depend on voltage. Uh, for now, we're going to uh, kind of skip this. Um, this is something we're going to cover in more detail in Unit 3. In a previous presentation, we talked about power and how power is equal to work divided by time. Well, so remember, power is measured in units of energy per time, like joules per second or BTUs per hour. There are also many common units for power that do not explicitly show energy per time, like, like horsepower, but they're still energy per time. The SI unit for power is the watt, as we talked about in the last presentation, which is, of course, equal to one joule for every second, which in agreement with the formula above is equal to newton meters times radians per second. Torque and angular speed are both vectors, right? So we have a vector here and we have a vector here. And like we'd mentioned in the previous presentation, they are a dot product. This, they are dotted together. In other words, when they are multiplied together, they're going to be at their maximum when they're in the same direction. And that makes sense. When something's spinning, if you have a wheel that's spinning around and you apply a torque to it, well, you want that torque to go in the direction of the angular velocity to get it to go faster, right? But if you apply a torque in a direction that's not in the direction of the angular velocity, let's say uh, parallel with the radius of, the, of a wheel, for example, well, you're not going to help it spin any faster. So they're a dot product, and dot products are scalars. So this vector times this vector gives us a scalar. And energy is a scalar as well as power. Because if you take a scalar and divide it by time, it's still a scalar. All right, so let's take a look at this. Based on our previous equation, torque times speed is power. If either one of these is zero, then power is zero, right? If omega naught is really, really fast, right? We have this really, really high speed, but the torque is zero because we have no load on it, well, then we have zero power. And then we go to the opposite end of the spectrum where we have T stall, and we've got lots of torque. We're at our maximum torque, but the speed is zero. Again, power is zero. So at both ends of the spectrum here, we're going to get zero power. What about in the middle, right? Well, halfway in the middle is where we're going to find our maximum power. This is where you're going to get the most power out of your motor if it has to exert half of its stall torque. Why, you ask? Glad you, I'm glad you're curious about these things. Uh, again, you can understand the main point of this uh, presentation without a lot of algebra, and you can apply it. But I think we want to talk about it a little bit deeper so that you can understand why this is the case. So speed is linear with torque, and it has a negative slope, right? So that gives us our equation, omega equals negative omega naught over tau stall 
times tau plus the omega naught, the speed at no load. So if you multiply speed by torque, we're going to end up getting a quadratic equation. So let's see what that looks like. So here's our equation. We're going to go ahead and multiply both sides by the torque. And that's going to look like this. Well, torque times omega is power. Well, what about the rest of this when we multiply it by torque? Well, we need to distribute this inside of the parentheses. And so we end up with negative omega naught over our stall torque. That's our slope, remember times the torque squared plus omega naught times the torque. What shape is this? This is a down facing parabola. We know that y equals x squared, right? Remember this is y and this is x. Well y equals x squared gives you a parabola, but we got this negative sign here, right? So this is going to give us a down facing parabola. So now that we know that this is a downward facing parabola, we have to know is 0, 0 a valid data point? Well, if the power is 0, we see that the torque also has to be 0. When power is 0, the torque is 0. Because if the torque's not 0, then we're not going to get a 0 power. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here's 0, 0 as a valid data point and a upside down parabola. The maximum power is right here at the very middle of our parabola when we're at half torque stall, right? Half of the amount of torque it takes to stall out this motor. Well, half is a very convenient number, so this is rather nice for us. So let's take a look at a little apparatus we have here. We have a motor, and it's connected with what's called a bar lock um, to this piece of metal. From the axle to the point where our force sensor is connected is a distance of three inches. And when this motor is trying to spin, right? It's trying to spin in the clockwise fashion. It's pulling on this sensor. And it's going to keep pulling on it until this thing can't turn anymore. And we're going to get a force of 1.4 pounds. We have a force of 1.4 pounds and a distance of 3 inches. That is our stall torque, right? So we'll go ahead and do the calculation. And the distance times the perpendicular force is 3 inches times 1.4 pounds it gives us 4.2 pound inches of torque and that's our stall torque all right so then the question of course is what will the motor deliver at its maximum power what will that torque be well it's half of the stall torque as we discovered in the previous slides so we take our maximum torque divided by half in half take our maximum torque divided in half and we get 2.1 pound inches. So this is the amount of torque that we want to supply and get maximum power out of our motors. So let's have another little setup here. Uh, we have some VEX material clamped to a tabletop. We have a motor turning a gear wrapped in construction papers. So it makes like a drum. And we're lifting a weight. This weight only weighs 0.2 pounds not too heavy. The radius of our wheel is two inches. So if you want to get maximum power from that VEX motor uh, using this winch, we need it to exert 2.1 pound inches. But as designed here with a direct drive, the motor is only exerting a torque of 0.4 pound inches. Where did we get that? Well, let's do the calculation. The torque out is equal to the distance times the perpendicular force. Now, it can get confusing. We're talking about a moment arm here, right? How long it is from this axle to the outer edge of this drum here. Well, that's the radius of this circle. So yeah, we're using the letter D because we're talking about distance or displacement here, um, not diameter. So I want to make sure that you're clear on that inches times 0.2 only gives us 0.4 pound inches. This motor is not going to be at its maximum power rating. What can we do? Well, we could change the gear ratio. Well, how do we calculate that? Let's take a look. So instead of direct drive, what gear ratio would make this motor deliver its maximum power? So we need to come up with a gear train that'll make that happen. Well, 
we can remember from a previous presentation that the gear ratio is equal to the output torque divided by the input torque. Well, the output torque of this system is 0.4 inch-pounds. We saw that in the previous slide. We want to put in 2.1 inch-pounds because that's when we have the maximum amount of power. Well, if you do the division, you get 0.19, which is approximately equal to a 12-tooth gear divided by a 60-tooth gear. So we add those gears to our system. So we can see now that the motor is driving this 60-tooth gear. The 60-tooth gear is driving the 12-tooth gear, which is on the same axle as our drum, which is then turning, pulling the string, and lifting this weight. Let's see how this relates to everyday life, like a bicycle, like a motor. The elliptical motions made by a person's legs go faster when less force is required. When no force is exerted, the motion is going to be at its fastest. A no load speed with no power delivered. When the force is so large that the leg muscles cannot overcome it, the speed is going to be zero and no power is going to be delivered. Somewhere in between, there is a force at which the legs can deliver maximum power. Shifting gears, well, they're actually sprockets, the bike rider is able to change the gear ratio between the bottom bracket, and that's this section right here, and the rear axle, okay, where the, of course the rear wheel is mounted. The rider can use the same force with their leg muscles when going uphill as when going downhill by using a larger gear ratio for uphill. Even for flat surfaces, sprockets with a variety of gear ratios help a rider reach top speeds. On a bike with only one gear ratio, the rider is unable to provide any power beyond her no load speed. Shifting to sprockets with a low gear ratio, the rider can provide power at a lower number of rotations per minute at the pedals compared to the rear wheel. Now, it can be confusing. A low gear ratio is the higher numbers on your bike. So the higher numbers on your bike are actually lower gear ratios. And the low numbers on your bike are actually the higher gear ratios. Well, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you learned a lot about maximizing the power from your motors.